Sambanani Hilton Baptist Church. As many of you know, the motto of our church is becoming fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. Put that in one word, that's called discipleship. The command in the New Testament is that we would become disciples and that we would make disciples. We're putting together a series of videos on some of the spiritual disciplines that would aid you in the process of becoming a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. I would contend that there's, there's three core disciplines, prayer, scripture reading, and fellowship in a local church. Out of those three, I, I would argue that the foundational one is scripture reading. If you wanted to know how to pray, who you're praying to, what prayer looks like, what better place to go than Scripture? If you want to know what a local fellowship looks like, what are its responsibilities to you and I? What are our responsibilities to that local fellowship? Where else should we get those answers? But Scripture. Scripture is a foundational and key spiritual discipline. In this video, we'll talk about Scripture reading. We'll talk a little bit about the theories behind it and why we should do it. And we'll also get very practical at the end of the video on the hows. What's it look like to read scripture? Now I want to offer a disclaimer at the beginning. Most of the ideas and parts of this presentation are not original with me. I owe credit to John MacArthur, Chuck Lawless, and Elbert Smith. Some of those names you know, some you probably don't know. But they all aided me in learning how to read scripture and to find what God was really trying to communicate, what God was saying in that text, and to treat Scripture honestly and fairly for what it is, the Word of God. Also, being a good Baptist minister, this is going to be a three-part presentation. We're going to talk about the appeal of Scripture, your approach to Scripture, and the application of Scripture in our lives. Now, the appeal of Scripture is simply recognizing that Scripture itself testifies to its validity, to its usefulness, to its authenticity. Scripture says that it is the very Word of God. And it's based on what we find right at the beginning of Scripture in Genesis. We find that we serve a God who speaks. This is a God whose very words cause things to come into existence. There is nothing. He speaks. We have the universe. Not only is He a God who speaks, He's a God who desires to communicate with His people. He wants to speak to us. He's not some distant God that we have to figure out his thoughts and figure out what he's doing. No, he is a God that wants to communicate with us. We see that in Scripture from the beginning. He walks in the garden and speaks with Adam and Eve. He speaks to Abraham. He speaks to Moses. He speaks through the prophets. He speaks through Jesus. And ultimately, he speaks through his written word, through the Scripture. We have a God who supernaturally breathed his word through men, that he carried along by the Holy Spirit as they wrote. Now that's a combination of Paul's thoughts and Peter's thoughts about Scripture and how Scripture is the very Word of God, that God used the Holy Spirit through men to communicate to us His written Word. Now if we take those three things together, that we have a God who speaks, that we have a God who wants to communicate to us, and He has communicated to us, through a sure written word, we ought to be able to see the appeal of Scripture. That if we want to know this God that we claim to have a relationship with, we need to spend time in Scripture. That He has communicated to us in the written word. That ought to be enough to cause us to spend time in Scripture. But just in case it's not, there's actually some basic benefits to reading Scripture. And Scripture itself testifies to this. And tells us that it has benefits for us in our life right now. Jesus in John talks about sanctification comes by truth and the truth is in his word. Here in Luke, Jesus tells us that the one who is blessed is the one who knows and keeps the law. Would you like to grow in your spiritual walk? Peter tells us to desire the milk of the word because it causes growth for us. There's power in the word. Paul tells us that it's the power to salvation. The psalmist tells us that it is a light to our feet and a lamp to our path. You want to know how to be pure in your walk? The psalmist also tells us that if a young man desires to be pure, he needs to know and obey the commandments of God. Paul and Timothy tells us that the word is good for teaching, reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, and for equipping in every good work. 
So there's real practical benefits to reading Scripture. So we have a God who speaks to us. He wants to speak to us. He has spoken to us. And he's spoken to us in a way that benefits us. Scripture has a direct appeal to our lives. In light of that appeal of Scripture to our life, how should we approach Scripture? How should we look at this word and come to it? Given the fact that, that it is not just man's words, it is God's words written through the Holy Spirit acting through men. This isn't a history book. It's not a how-to book. It's not a series of good advice. It's actually God's words to us. In light of that, we need to carefully think about how we handle this book, how we handle these words, how we come to arrive at the meaning of this scripture. First, I would contend that we should approach scripture prayerfully. Listen to what the psalmist says in 119. I'll be reading the second part, verse 34 through 37. The psalmist prays, Give me understanding that I may keep your law and observe it with my whole heart. Lead me in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. Incline my heart to your testimonies and not to selfish gain. Turn my eyes from looking at worthless things and give me life in your ways. I think that's a great way for us to start any Bible study, any Bible reading, is to pray for understanding. Jesus promises the Holy Spirit who will lead us in all truth, in all understanding, and that includes in his word. So I think we should begin any approach to Scripture prayerfully. If we approach Scripture prayerfully, it'll lead to our next approach, which is humbly. Once again, these are the very words of God. These aren't some man's thoughts, some men's recollections about events. This is God trying to communicate to us. We need to handle this word humbly. I love Deuteronomy 29, 29. It says that the secret things belong to God. What that tells us is that he doesn't reveal everything to us in this scripture. Sometimes we treat like the Bible like it's got all the answers to every question I ever have. It, it doesn't really do that. It doesn't even say that it does that. It tells us enough about God for us to know him, to be able to worship him, for us to have trust in him, and to be able to have faith in him and to become a disciple of his. It doesn't always answer the whys. It doesn't even answer a lot of the very specifics, but it does give us guidelines. So, so we need to treat it humbly as we come there. But I love how Deuteronomy 29, 29 finishes. It says that the revealed things belong to us and to our children. That means these words are revealed from God. This is how God has revealed himself to us. That, that ought to humble us. That the creator of the universe, this God who speaks and things come into existence, speaks directly to us. Speaks directly to you and me. We need to treat his word humbly. If we get the first two right, come to this prayerfully and humbly, I think it should naturally lead to this. We need to come to Scripture obediently. James tells us to be doers of the Word, not hearers only. That if we're hearers only, we're, we're like somebody that looks in a mirror, sees his face, but when he turns around, forgets what he looks like. God forbid that that should be anybody that claims to be a disciple of Christ. We need to come to Scripture before we read it, with our mind made up that we're going to obey it, that whatever God commands in his very word, we will obey and do. My last admonition for you in your approach to Scripture is, is to see Jesus in Scripture. Jesus himself testifies in both John and Luke to the religious leaders of his day that as they search Scriptures, they miss the point, that all the Scriptures actually point to him. Now, I'm not encouraging you to allegorize the scripture and to make up some stories and really twist it so that everything is always about Jesus, but recognize that Jesus himself testifies that scripture is about him. So as we read through the creation account, we see that, that Jesus is the second Adam. He's the Adam that kept the law perfectly, that did not rebel against God. As we read through Exodus, we realize that Jesus is the new Moses, the one who has led us out of bondage, in captivity to sin, and led us into the promised land where we have freedom in Christ and freedom in relationship with God. So see Jesus throughout Scripture. Now, if we get these things right, we, we've kind of answered the why of Scripture. 
the, the appeal of Scripture and our approach to Scripture, and, and why we ought to be involved in it and how we should handle it. I want to spend the rest of our time being very practical on, on how we should apply Scripture. What's it look like in our life? If I, I had to s summarize this in one very small sentence, it would be this. Have a plan. Know where you're going. Have a plan for how you read Scripture. Don't be one of these that says, mm, I want to see what God has to say to me today, and just open and read a verse and, and be done with it. Paul says we have to spend time studying Scripture, that we have to study to show ourselves approved. Scripture is worth our time to study it. So, so have a plan as we work through Scripture. Well, what's it look like to have a plan? Well, first off, you've got to decide what you are going to read. Now, the, your options here are myriad. You have a lot of choices. Fortunately, we live in a modern age where you actually don't have to make a big decision. All of these are websites that I highly recommend that have reading plans. Some of these reading plans are as short as five minutes a day, all the way up to trying to read through the entire Bible in a year with the New Testament twice in a year. But they're varied from that. It could be over the course of two years to read the whole, whole Bible. Uh, there's options that include studying people in the Bible, studying themes, studying doctrines, studying theology, reading the key chapters in the Bible, and really studying them. You have a lot of choices, and all of these websites will provide options for you. Bible Gateway and BlueLetterBible.org both provide commentaries and Bible reading plans and have apps for your phone or your tablet that will send a daily reading to you to go through. The Bible uh, Navigators.org has a Bible reading plan that I recommend. It's a 25-day a month reading plan. So that means every month you've got five to six days to either catch up or to make up your time. You'd have a reading from the Old Testament and a reading from a Psalm and a New Testament. In the course of the year, you will have worked your way through the entirety of Scripture. One of my favorites is on 5daybiblereading.com. It's a chronological plan. You actually read five days a week, so you have weekends essentially to either catch up or to read other things. But it pairs up events in Scripture with where they're happening. So if David has written a psalm that occurs with something in his life, when you read about that occurrence, say in Chronicles, you will come back and find that in the psalm. So it takes things from Samuel and Kings and Chronicles, pairs them up with some other events. So it's a chronological reading plan. Uh, you'll read from the Old Testament and the New Testament on that five days a week. The thing is, is have a plan. Know where you're going. Don't read so much that, that, that you can't digest it, but don't read so little that you're not moving forward. Have a plan. Know what you're going to read. As important, if not more important, than knowing what you're going to read is, is how do I read this? If this is the very Word of God, then it's not just a book for me to read and try to get to the end and see who did it. I need to spend time in it. I need to allow this book to change my heart because it is God's word to me. It is God's way of sanctifying me, of making me a true follower of his. So, so I need to treat it as such. There's lots of ways and approaches to studying the Bible to reading. Let me recommend two first one would be an inductive Bible study. This is something that you can do as an individual. This is something you can do in a group setting, in your home group, or in a Bible study group. It's something you can do as a family. First step in an inductive Bible study is observation. All we're doing in observation is we're looking at a text and we're answering the questions of who, what, when, where, why, and how. As you read through the text, look for the things that give you clues that are going to help us when we try to figure out the meaning. Are there words that are repeated? Look for the transition words, the therefores, the so that's, the buts, the because, all those words that indicate, hey, there's a transitioning happening here. He's given us reasoning for these things. Look for lists. Look for contrasts. Look for cause and effect. Now, it seems like a lot of things to look for, and it is. I recommend you having a scrap piece of paper around where you can write down the things that you observe. But all we're doing is simply making observations, noting things that we see in that. After we've done that step, we've observed everything that's in there, we can move on to the second step, which is interpretation. We're asking, what does it mean? Now, let me be very clear here. When we ask that question, I'm not asking, what does it mean to me? I would love for you to remove that from your vocabulary, from your small groups discussions of what does it mean to you? Scripture 
has its meaning found in what the author meant when he was inspired by God to write that passage. The meaning belongs to the author. It doesn't belong to me. It doesn't belong to you. Biblical interpretation is trying to find the meaning that the author intended for that passage. In order for us to find that, there's several things we need to look at. One is context. One, a literary context, meaning, all right, how's this word fit in this sentence? How's this sentence fit in this passage? How's this passage fit in the chapter, chapter and book, book in the entirety of Bible? How's it fit in the whole story of Scripture? What type of literature is it? Will I read a letter differently than apocalyptic literature versus prophetic literature versus historical literature? That should influence how I interpret things or how I find the meaning in a passage. Context also includes the cultural context. Was this written to Greeks? Was it written to Romans? Was it written to Jews? Who was this letter or this part of the book written to? What was the point of this book? What were the cultural times like? Was this during persecution? Was it during the exile? Was it during uh, capture in Babylon? What was the context for where this was written? After I'm looking at context, I also want to be honest and just take the simplest, clearest meaning of the passage. Don't look for hidden meanings. Don't try to twist it and find, oh, well, I know this is what's written, but this is what God meant when this was written. No, generally speaking, the clearest, simplest interpretation is the one you should go with. The one that is written, stand with that. Even then, sometimes, though, it's hard to understand. We know Peter himself talks about Paul's writing and says that some of them are very hard to understand. So look for connections. Look for where this passage fits with a more clear passage. How does it fit? How does it connect to the whole of Scripture? How does it connect to the whole story of redemption? In other words, let the simple, clear passages inform you on the more obscure, the harder to understand passages. Don't build doctrine on some obscure doctrine or uh, some obscure verse. Build it on something that's clear and easy to understand. All this could be summed up in that phrase of let Scripture interpret Scripture. Scripture should interpret Scripture. Let the simple, clear parts interpret the harder to understand parts. After you've done observation, after you've done interpretation, if you stopped there, you've missed the point. All you've done at that point is gained head knowledge. All you've done is done things that may puff you up, may puff me up. We need to move on to application. How does this apply to me? How can I take this passage, then I've found the author's meaning, how can I apply it in my life in becoming more like Christ, in becoming a true disciple? Let me encourage you in this step is, one, be specific. Don't be general and say, well, I'm supposed to love my neighbor. Be specific with that. I need to take my neighbor some brownies. I need to spend time with them. I need to offer to babysit their children. How can I actually show love to my neighbor? And then be accountable with that. Not only maybe inform somebody else about that, but put a time frame on how you're going to obey. Don't just make it some generic off in the future. Say, hey, by the end of this week, I'm going to have done this for my neighbor in obedience to what I've read in this passage. So that's inductive Bible study. Observation, interpretation, application, something that could be done by anybody, be easily done in a group setting. Let me offer you another possibility, and that's called the SPECA method. SPECA is just an acronym that we use to lay out how, as I read through a passage, I can look and observe things and not just blow through that. It starts with S. As I read, is there a sin to confess? When I read through this passage, maybe there's a sin present, and it's something I need to confess in my life. Is there a promise to claim? Now, not every promise in Scripture applies to you and me. Some are very specific to people and places and events in the past. But a lot of promises in Scripture do apply to us. And if there's a promise there, I need to be encouraged by that promise that He will not forsake me, that He is with me to the very end is a promise I can claim and need to live out in my life. Is there an example to follow or not follow? Like, we may not want to follow David's example with Bathsheba, but his example of repentance, of worship, are examples we could follow. Is there a command to obey present in that scripture? Is there knowledge I gain of man, of God, or even of redemptive history? I've gained some new knowledge. Maybe there's the application then. How am I going to apply this to my life? Let me encourage you as you do this, not every passage you read is going to have every letter in speck it. But what I found helpful 
is as you read through the passage, when you see a sin to confess, you can write a little S beside it. And when you see a promise, put a little P beside it. And you can go through there and know, hey, here's these things, and I've spent time kind of pulling through this passage and really recognizing and seeing what's there. This is something you can encourage your children to do and teach them to do a speck of method. After we figured out what we're going to read and how we're going to read it, let me encourage you to have some other resources present for you and things that you can use in your life. One is, is to journal things. Write down. Now, I'll confess I'm not the best at journaling, but don't make it something that's onerous and something that's voluminous. It's okay to just write down one word, one verse from that day, something that stood out. Write down some of your prayer requests, something you learned that day. But it enables you to see how you progressed, where you started, where you're going, where you're going to wind up. It's really good to journal. In addition to journaling, uh, get a Bible that maybe lets you journal. This is a journaling Bible, which has large margins, and you can write things out to the side, things you've picked up and things you've learned. Get a study Bible, study Bibles and commentaries that will inform you to what you've read, what you're learning. Uh, if you're like me, you're going to have a lot of parts of Scripture where you're going to read, and you're going, what is that? What's a mina? You know, I thought a mina was like a bird, or is it a coin? What, what is it? Commentaries can help you inform that. Bible dictionaries can help you figure those sorts of things out. Let me give you a word of caution on a commentary. Don't read a commentary till you've already read the passage yourself. Spend some time. You've tried to figure out the meaning. After you've done that, go to a commentary. There's not a bit of scripture that somebody hasn't read and written an opinion on and written what they think God's trying to communicate. The Bible Gateway app and the Blue Letter Bible app both have lots of commentaries that when you're reading, you can see what other people have thought. I'm not saying you have to agree with all of them, but read and see what other people thought. Another word of caution there, if you do read a passage and you think it means this, and you read some commentaries, and you're the only person that came up with this meaning, you may want to backtrack and go back and reread that and see how you came to this meaning. Another option to use is a Bible atlas. Now this is a big old book. You'll have a very small version of this in the back of your Bible. But the Bible atlas is very good, especially if you have young children in your family. As you do Bible studies, there's always questions about where these things happened. Sometimes we treat these stories from the Old Testament as, well, they're fairy tales. They don't seem real. But when I can take pictures and show maps and see where things happened and where they'll have pictures of how the temple was laid out and pictures of coins and what cities look like, it makes the Bible become real and alive to your children and to you, and you have a good idea of what's coming and what really is happening in that. It helps you with the context helps you find the meaning in that passage. Let me encourage you to spend time reading Scripture. Martin Luther is credited with saying that, that faith is not an achievement, it is a gift, but it comes by hearing and studying the Word of God. That's quite a, a take on Romans, where Paul tells us that, that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. If you truly want to know God, if you want to know his desires for your life, if you want to have a real relationship with him, you have to do it on his terms. You have to do it on how he has revealed himself to us, to you and I. The sure way that he has revealed himself to us is his written word. This is how God has revealed himself to us. Let me encourage you, start somewhere. It doesn't have to be dramatic. You're not going to be a marathoner day one. It's okay to start short. Start short, but just start. Have a plan. Spend time reading Scripture. It's well worth your time. It is the way for you to know God. 